talked this morning about uh, turning water into wine. And um, I don't think I could do that. Uh, I don't know, maybe I can. I don't have reason to, so I'm not going to. And so uh, Jesus did, and he did it for a reason. And I'll repeat that again. Jesus turned water into wine, and he did it for a reason. And so we're going to look into that. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to the second chapter of John. I just wanted to make sure I was going to put you in the right place. We're going to read John 2, 1 to 11 in just a minute. John 2, 1 to 11. But we're going to talk about Jesus' first miracle. And not just his first miracle. There's a hidden lesson. As a matter of fact, there's a few hidden lessons in this uh, text. And so we're going to look at it real closely. And uh, we're going to go out of here today blessed because of what Jesus did and how he was looking forward, not just to that moment uh, and what would happen, but the future and what would happen with us. Praise God. And so there's a hidden lesson in there. We'll get to it. I want you to read this look at the screen and uh, I'll read it, but you can follow along. It says, Jesus managed the momentum of his ministry. That's a lot of M's there. Manage the momentum of his ministry. What does that mean? So that things would happen according to God's timing and not according to the will and whims of people. My goodness, if you listen to people today, you'll be pulled every which way but crazy. And you might even lapse into that for a few minutes. Uh, People will pull you this way, that way. How about your family? They'll pull you this way and that way. Uh, You know, people in the world will do that. So you have to be very careful. And Jesus was, believe me. One of his family members was going to pull him into something. And Jesus was going to say, it's not yet my time. But we're we're going to see how Jesus handled it. And I think it's going to help you uh, practically. So we're going to look at God's amazing timing and how it relates to your quality of life. And I want to tell you something. Ever since I got saved, God's timing, I've, I've known this for a long time, is the greatest and the best way to go. And it's the greatest blessing when you follow his lead and his timing. And he may take you out of your way, but you'll see it's the best way. You had a, you had a way to go. That was much better, but it'll take you out. You'll find out, take you out of your road. You'll find out it's the blessed way, and it's the way to the greatest blessing. Praise God. So let's go to John chapter 2, and we're going to read this whole uh, 11 verses uh, this morning. Turning water into wine. Jesus is going to do that. So let's look at it. John 2, verse 1. It says, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And so the miracles going to take place again around Galilee. 75% of Jesus' ministry was in Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee. So we're we're not going to call it the Sea of Galilee. We're going to call it the Sea of Miracles. How's that? A lot of miracles happened in Galilee. Now, some happened in Jerusalem and in Judea, but most of them happened up in Galilee. So here comes the mother of Jesus, and it says here, and the mother of Jesus was there at the wedding. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the wedding or to the marriage. Verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. That was a good thing to say, right? And Jesus said to her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour has not yet come. Hmm. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. And Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear it unto the governor of the feast and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the water knew. And the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have drunk, well drunk, not just drunk, but well drunk, then that which is worse 
but thou hast kept the good wine until now. There's a lesson there. I can't wait to get to that. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. That's why we sang it. You deserve the glory, right? And his disciples believed on him. Wow. 11 verses, and there's a lot in there. Praise God. You're going to say, well, will we ever get out of church? Yes, we will. I promise you. Okay? So I want you to notice some things about Jesus' first miracle. And there's going to be several, I believe. There's going to be six, six of them. Six things I want you to really look at a little closer than you might normally. And number one, I want you to notice where Jesus is or where he was called to. That wasn't where he was, but then he was called to the wedding. And I want you, again, you're looking at God's timing and how it relates to your quality of life. Praise God. How many of you want a good quality of your life? Let, let me see your hand. Quality of life. I sure do. Praise God. And so the Lord has been improving that. Not with circumstances necessarily, but ever since I got saved, he's been improving that in my life. And it's been a joy to serve him in his time, not in my own. John 2.1 says, the third day there was a marriage. Now it's interesting. It says there was a third day. I think I've got a slide for that and how it relates to your quality of life, all right? Uh, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, before we get started on the miracle, I want you to read with me, it's up on the screen, Revelation 19.7. Revelation 19.7 says this, Let us be glad and rejoice, and give the honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Hallelujah. All right. That's a, that's a relationship, two different relate, right? Lord, the Lord and us, and we have a relationship with him that's a tantamount to a bride and a groom. Verse eight, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And that is a bestowment that the Lord has given to us. The raiment that we wear, the garment that we wear at this marriage feast is white. And that is given to us by the Lord. Praise God. So Jesus takes the ordinary. This is not, this is not scripture. This is just, a, uh, just an observation, okay? Jesus takes the ordinary and turns it into something extraordinary. Water into wine, right? Uh, because he wants you to live out of his overflow out of his overflow. Are you with me? This, this wine came from an overflow out of pitchers that the Jews used to cleanse, cleanse themselves, to make themselves ceremonially clean. Ceremonially clean. I have a little trouble. My tongue is getting in the way of my eye teeth and I can't see what I'm saying. He, uh, he changed water into wine. It was not merely a random act of kindness, Rather, it reflected and metaphorically filled the many Old Testament, fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures that speak of God's people, the proverbial bride and the bridegroom to come, Jesus himself. Hallelujah. Now, we got some guys in here today. Does it bother you to be called the bride of Christ? I hope it doesn't. Amen. Because that's the relationship that we have with him. He's the groom. We're the bride. He, we, we, he's the man. We listen to him. Amen? And so, uh, and by this, by this, at the end time, all right, both Israel and the church are able to worship together as the Israel of God. Hallelujah. So while Jesus is, is doing his work here at the wedding of Canaan, I want you to realize in the back of your mind that, that there's something he's looking forward to, praise God, something he's looking forward to in this future, and he's beginning his ministry, he's starting off his ministry with that in mind, and he wants us to see it, and he especially wanted his disciples to see it, and that's why it's recorded in scripture, and this is why it's going to bless you in your quality of life. So, number two, at the first miracle, notice what happened. It happened on the third day, that this is significant because a lot of Jewish weddings 
happened on the third day. And there's a reason why, and I want to show you why it's important, all right? So Jesus is going to do his first miracle on the third day. Hmm. Now, <laughs> that's, that's a, more than obvious, but watch, there's more. John 2.1 says, the third day was a marriage in Canaan, mother of Jesus was there. So I want you to understand there's three parts to a Jewish wedding. There's the Sadducan, which the arrangements are made before the betrothal. And I go over this a lot in my sermon when we get into the fall feast. The Arusin, which is the betrothal, also known as the Kedushin, which is a period of sanctification or being set apart. They prepare themselves for each other. That's what we're doing right now. God is preparing us as a bride for that gold, wonderful golden day when he returns and he calls us to be with him. And we sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we spend eternity with him. And so all this is going on in Jesus' mind while this miracle is taking place. And then you have the Nusen, which is the marriage itself. And that usually happened on the third day. Now, there's a reason for it happening on the third day. In Genesis 1.10, it says, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called the sea. And God saw, he said, that it was good. I, sh I should have left that big, so I just put it in parentheses so I could emphasize it. But that's part of the text, all right? That's not my little, that's not my two cents. Usually the parentheses are my little two cents. But this is, the, this is scripture. So first of all, when he created the earth and the seas, what did he say? It was good. Right? And the second thing, he, he created something else. It says, And God said, Let the earth forth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit yielding tree, after its own kind, whose seed is itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after its kind, and God saw it was good. All right? Every other creation, day of creation, God said it is good once. On this day, the third day, God said it is good twice. Jesus rose on the third day. The third day is a good day. Hallelujah. And that's why they, they were married on, on that day. And it was a good day, a doubly good day for the Lord to do this miracle. Now, there's another thing we need to notice. And that's Jesus and his disciples were called to the wedding. They weren't there at the beginning. They were called that third day. It was a good day, but Mary didn't think it was a good day because they ran out of what? They ran out of wine, right? And that was, that was an embarrassment to the bridegroom if they ran out of wine. So... Uh, she's going to call Jesus to the rescue here, okay? It says, verse 2, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So they weren't there prior. Verse 3, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. Now that was, as I said, was a disgrace. And Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. So what is he saying to his mother? He's saying, look, mom, <laughs> you know, my, my father, my heavenly father directs my ministry. I love you. You know, he was, this, this might look like strong language, but this was respectful language, believe me, at, at that time. And it was very respectful, but he did say, I, I got to hear from the father. I, I can't just do what you tell me to do. Amen. That, that's a lesson for all of us today. So I'm going to read the, these two paragraphs. Uh, it says, it seems that Jesus managed the momentum of his ministry so that things would happen according to God's timing. That was in the beginning slide, but there's more. Not according to the will and whims of people. Even Jesus' mother could not hurry things along. Is there anybody in your life that could get you to move in the wrong direction? When Jesus said to Mary, my hour has not yet come, but then performed a miracle anyway, and we all know he did, right? 
He demonstrated respect and compassion for Mary, but he also prioritized the scheduling in which the work of God was to be done. And oh, by the way, this was not the first, or this was the first time it happened, but it wasn't going to be the last time it happened. And I'll show you in John chapter 7 how that happened again. But he wasn't going to let anybody manage his ministry but the Father. And that's a point for all of us to take. John 7, 3. Now here's another time it happened to Jesus. Somebody else is trying to micromanage Jesus. And that's a lot of the church's problem today. They serve a Jesus whom they can manage. Write that down, please. I serve a Jesus I can manage. No, I don't. An image that they made, right. It's, yes, and it's a, fa a false image of Jesus. And so, um, you know, you see a, maybe a lot of your friends, a lot of people that will call themselves Christians, but they, they manage to get around God's word, the doctrine of Christ, the words of Christ. They get around it. How do they do that? I can't do that. I don't, I don't know how. Well, they, they, they manage Jesus instead of Jesus managing them. How do you think that's going to work for them? I don't think very good. His brethren said, this is John 7, 3. So we're, going to, we're talking about his brothers now and his family. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go to Judea that thy disciples may see thy works that thou doest. You want to make yourself a public figure or you want to be a public figure? Go out and make yourself a public figure. Go out and promote yourself. How do you think Jesus is going to handle that? We've got advanced information how he handled his mother. Now he's going to, you're going to see how he handled his brothers and sisters. Now if we drop, this is at the Feast of Tabernacles, by the way. And that's when everybody's in Israel. All the Jews are in, are, they're in Israel. They're in Jerusalem. All the Jews are there for the Feast of Tabernacles. That's a big one. And so uh, his brothers are telling him, get out there and preach. Get out there and, you know, show everybody what you got. So verse 6, we're going to drop down to, says this. Then Jesus said unto them, oh, I love this. My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. Your time is always ready. I don't know how many times. I can remember good friends of mine uh, telling me to do something in a service one time that was totally out of order in the service. Totally. These were, you know, people that, you know, they really loved Jesus. They really did. And so, you know, I wasn't faulting them because it seemed like a good thing to do. And they said, you know, get up and do it. Get up and do it. Get up and do it. And I said, no, I will not do it. It's not in order. It's not in the Father's order. And, uh, you know, I don't know if they ever forgot that or not, but uh, it seemed right to them, but it didn't seem right to me. And, you know, I'm very glad I did because it wasn't right. And they're godly people, like I said, and I respect them to this day. But, um, you know, you got, you've got to be very careful. So he said, Jesus said to them, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. And look, please, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a guy that likes to seize the moment. I do. But be very careful. Jesus is trying to teach us a lesson here. And so he told his own mother, he said, you know, my time is not yet. Not yet. Okay. But then, you know, later, just like the, 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 these two miracles kind of parallel, because then Jesus, after his brothers tell him not to go to the feast, what does he do? He secretly goes to the feast. The, the Lord didn't want him to go like gangbusters. He wanted him to Kind of creep in secretly. Okay, so next. What else do we need to know? Everything was based on whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And that's verse 5. His mother saith unto the servant, whatsoever, or servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Who's giving the commands? Jesus, right? And these people are told by Mary, Whatever Jesus says, do it. My goodness, what advice to us this morning. Amen? Whatever he says, do it. How many have ever, when Jesus tells you to do something, how many of you have ever felt like, I don't know if I want to do that? Anybody besides me? Uh-huh. 
Whatever he says, do it. These people are asking for wine. Jesus is saying, all right, here, fill these up with water. You, you, you're not, Jesus, you're not going to be able to pull this one off, right? With this water. That's what he does. That's right. Come on, John. Verse 6. And there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. And they had to get cleaned up before the meal, right? Containing two or three firkins apiece. I should have looked that up. I don't know what a firkin is, but I'm sure they, every picture I see of those jugs, they're big jugs, right? And so verse 7, Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. Whoa, okay. Not, don't you got no wine hit, hidden in the back or something? And they filled them up to the brim. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, that, that's, that, that's a sermon right there, isn't it? I mean, they filled them full. And Jesus said unto them, draw out now and bear to the governor of the feast, and they bear it. Like, you, you are absolutely out of your mind, Jesus. We're going to take the, 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 the leader of the, uh, the governor of the banquet. We're going to take him water. Well, you know what happened. I don't have to tell you, right? But the point is, the lesson is, whatever you're told by Jesus, you do it. You do it. As a pastor, you will be blessed. I will say this to you. You will be so blessed if you do what the Lord tells you to do, right? Um, now, it's interesting because there's going to be a statement that uh, here, and we kind of alluded to this before the service, that the best is kept for last. He's going to say this. Now, I want you to see this. Verse, this is John 2, 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that it was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have drunk, or uh, I always want to say drunk well, well drunk, <laughs> but they weren't, I don't know if they were drunk or not, but anyway, then they which, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. I think David said, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's what that acronym is. Y-A-S-N-Y, right? It's not, you, ha, you ain't seen New York City. It's, you ain't, seen, you ain't seen nothing yet. And so, you know, here's a, here's a principle in the word of God for us. Praise God. You, you think the miracles and the wonderful things that Jesus did around the Sea of Galilee, they were awesome and wonderful. But I want you to know right now, and there are people, we watched a video last night, of people that go and visit the Sea of Galilee uh, to, to want to really get in touch with what Jesus did and what he ate and the boat he, he uh, traveled in across the Sea of Galilee and so forth. As great as those miracles were, beloved, we ain't seen nothing yet. We haven't seen. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, either has it entered into the mind what God has prepared in advance for those who love him. We haven't seen it yet. We, we really haven't. As, as awesome as the word of God is uh, and the miracles that we've read, greater things, we should have sang that one, greater things are yet to come because there are. And that's for you and me. That's not just for, you know, the pastors or for the apostles or for the prophets. But there are greater things for us in store. And we need to be ready for them. Remember, I, I, I have it in here twice for a reason. Revelation 19, 7, let us be glad and rejoice. This is our future. And give honor to him, for the marriage of the lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Now, I want you to understand, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but this is important that you look at those words. The wife the bride has made herself ready because the next verse tells you how the bride makes herself ready. Are you ready for this? This is strong medicine. This is, this is not medicine for those who want to manipulate Jesus, who want to maneuver him to make their life the way they want. Listen to verse 8. 
and to her was granted. What does it mean to be granted? To her was given. What was given to her? That she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. For the marriage of the land has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Past tense. Past tense. The wife hath made. When the wife was on earth, she made herself ready for that gift that God has given her. What was the gift? White raiment. What is white raiment? Holiness. Holiness. That makes the church cringe. Because Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. You know, he did it all. Yeah, but he. what does he want the bride to do? He says, be ready, make yourself ready. Well, how does the bride make herself ready? She makes herself ready in a way that one day she will wear that right, white raiment in glory. Be, why? Because she allowed the Lord to, to appropriate, or not to appropriate, she appropriated the garments on earth. Hallelujah. You're, are you ready to wear white? Are you appropriating the holiness that the Lord wants to put into your life? Because Jesus never said anything about not living a holy life. But he was holy unto God, the Father, and we need to be the same. Hallelujah. It says down the bottom, praising God for what we have is pray. This is from Matthew Henry. I love Matthew Henry. Uh, praising God for what we have is praying for what is yet. Further to be done for us. There is harmony between the angels, we sang it, and the saints in his triumphant song. Christ is the bridegroom of his ransomed church. Why did Jesus ransom us? We sing that hymn, hallelujah, Jesus ransomed me. We needed it. But we need, didn't... We didn't need him to save us to live the same kind of life we lived before. It just doesn't make an ounce of earthly sense, and it certainly doesn't make an ounce of, of heavenly sense. How does the bride make herself ready? She gets ready to wear white. Hallelujah. Just praise God. What is white a symbol of in a wedding? Purity. Amen. The bride is supposed to be pure. Notice I said supposed to be pure. We don't live in an age, in a generation where they understand this. But the bride is to be pure, undefiled, spotless for the, for the husband. And so the picture is very, very strong. Praise God. And the good thing is, if we live that kind of life, praise God, we can, we can quote this acronym, you ain't seen nothing yet. Hallelujah. Because he's got greater things yet in store for us. Praise his holy name. And finally... We notice that it was all for the disciples and Jesus' glory. You know, a lot of people think that this miracle was for, you know, everybody around. But I want, I want, I want you to read the text slowly. This miracle wasn't for everybody watching. This miracle was for the disciples, and it was for Jesus' glory. It was to, this miracle was to draw the disciples in. Praise God. When you work for the Lord, when you do business for God, you need encouragement. Praise God. These things that we prayed for this morning, I want to stand up, but I won't. These things that we prayed for this morning, we're going to see them. And we've got to see them because they're going to be encouraging to us. And I don't know what next week's going to hold. And I don't know what the week after that's going to hold. Ed Varnes doesn't know. Larry Mills doesn't know. Rachel, you don't know. None of us know. But we're, we're trusting God with everything that we have within us. I, I want to wear white that day. Praise God. I don't, I don't want a blue suit. I want white. And that starts right now. Hallelujah. John 2.11 says, this is the beginning of miracles. Notice, the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, or as we said in the beginning, uh, the Lake of Miracles, and manifested forth his glory. So what was the miracle for? His glory and his disciples believed on him. 
Hallelujah. You know, one of the th first things after I got saved was I got called into the ministry. I really did. But I needed to see some stuff before I traipsed off to, to college and so forth and prepare. And, and I had the opportunity to see the Lord do many, many miraculous things when I was young in my faith. Many, many miraculous things. I needed that encouragement. And it's the same thing at this point. Only really, if you read back in the text, you'll find out that the, the, the bridegroom knew that Jesus changed the water into wine and the master of the ceremony knew it. And that was it. And his disciples, not the crowd. They didn't know where the wine came from. Are you with me? So it wasn't for the people. It was, it was for the disciples. So uh, not for his mother either. Hallelujah. Not for his mother. And I know there are churches that put a lot of emphasis on Mary, but it wasn't for her. Praise God. So I want you to really take in this whole miracle this morning. And I want to finish with this last paragraph. But I want you to take this all in. Think about what we, what we, just, what we just looked at. If we go through this again real fast, uh, you, you know, he's at a wedding. It happened on the third day. His disciples were called. They weren't there, but Mary called them. And then they were told whatsoever Jesus saith unto you, you do it. And then uh, they discovered Jesus, uh, that Jesus saved the best for last, the good wine for last. And that's what he's doing for us. And then, uh, of course, we understand where this miracle came from. But you don't see Jesus out there holding the water pots, crying out to Almighty God, Father, change this water into wine. You don't see that. What do you see? You see Jesus just quietly willing it. I don't know if that hits you like it hits me. But if you're a disciple, you look at Jesus willing it and you cross your arms and say, only the Father can do something like that. You must be the Son of God. Hallelujah. You must be his son. And I'll tell you what, nothing's going to put the fire in you like that. Nothing. Here there is not even a word, no means of any kind employed, but the silent putting forth of his will, which without token, without visible, audible indication of any sort, passes with sovereign power into the midst of material things. And their works according to his own purpose. Is not this the signature of divinity? Isn't this God? The Son of God? That without means, the mere forth putting of will is all that is wanted to mold matter as plastic into his command. That's by Alexander McLaren, but I wanted to put that in there because I wanted you to see that. Amen. Just by his will, the, everything, everything in this world can, can change and morph just by him willing it. He doesn't have to come into this situation. He doesn't, it, you know, he healed somebody from a distance. We, we know from scripture. He healed some, a man from, from a distance, somebody's son from a distance just by his will. And so I want you to understand and realize that this morning as we pray, that Jesus, all he needs to do is will it. And we know, we, we know it with the eye. We know God wills to heal you. We know God wills to heal me of diabetes and these different things. We know it. And so we can go forward in faith and strength because it's his will, and if it's his will, it's going to happen, beloved. And so we haven't seen anything yet. We're going to see more, greater miracles, greater signs, greater wonders, greater things than we could ask for or imagine from our God. And he's just giving us a glimpse here. He says, if I did this in the beginning, imagine what I'm going to do for you right now in this day and age. Praise his holy name. Amen. Let's... Let's pray. Let's thank him. Amen. Can we do that this morning? The Bible says, 
enter his gates with thanksgiving. Let's just thank him. Let's not ask. Let's just thank him for his goodness. That song on my heart this morning, I will sing of the goodness of God. Lord, we thank you. Lord. We